so what I'd like to do in this uh, talk this morning is to talk about uh, three application areas that we've been involved in, in control aspects of some rather large-scale um, applications. Uh, first one in automotive engine management, where we have, um, uh, I've been collaborating with my colleague Nick Collings, who's a professor of applied thermodynamics. Um, now, a more recent uh, project on uh, vibration control um, in oil well drilling. And finally, uh, some uh, current PhD student working on control of combustion oscillations. So in the general area of automotive engine management, first I'd just like to set the scene about whether um, <coughs> are, are people trying hard enough to resolve the questions about automotive um, control. So how much R&D is done in the world? Um, well, from uh, one uh, EU survey, I don't know if you can read these, uh, uh, <coughs> but the amount of worldwide R&D investment by company rather than by sector, um, Toyota is number one, Volkswagen number two, GM number five, Ford number nine, Honda number 11, and Daimler number 13. So <coughs> of all the R&D done, those uh, particular companies um, uh, dominate the top 13, all in automotive. And by sector, again divided up uh, here between the EU in blue, the USA in red, Japan in green, and other countries in gray, we'll see that the automobiles um, come in third there, uh, with pharmaceuticals um, dominating, but, uh, but not much ahead in total volume. An interesting comparison between Japan and the United States with regard to pharmaceuticals and automotive. And things that we think of as being very high in um, R&D expenditure, aerospace and defense, um, quite a small fraction, 20, 30% of that uh, done in automotive. So what difference does that make? Well, <coughs> in the, the legislative drivers for automotive, um, in the, until relatively recently, have been very much focused on meeting emissions legislation. So the EU clean air legislation, um, <coughs> which has made dramatic reductions, order of magnitude reductions in the emissions from particulate matter and NOx over the last um, uh, decade or two. Um, not always as effective with regard to air quality, um, partly because the legislation is all based on the drive cycle, and uh, whereas people drive normal cycles rather than drive cycles. So the top in the sort of standard <coughs> engine speed on the x-axis and um, uh, load on the uh, y-axis, so the drive cycle uh, is in this region, whereas normal driving is in this region with a large fraction stationary or the, the vehicle stationary or coasting and a large fraction at maximum possible um, power. Um, and so meeting very stringent regulation in this area where the major manufacturers are obliged to pass uh, doesn't necessarily imply you're nearly as good over that typical drive cycle. And the, again, with changes in the uh, problems of climate change legislation, the carbon dioxide emissions per kilometer is now a leading driver for much of the R&D around the world. The performance trends in the US, which are somewhat similar to, to the EU, um, and a striking one is how the horsepower per cubic inch displacement, that's a, a US unit, so the <coughs> kilowatts per liter um, has gone by, uh, in, increased by a factor of uh, from uh, two or three over the last um, uh, 20, 30 years. And 
the types of technologies, I won't go into that, but um, how, how these, those have evolved over that same period and going from two to three to four valve engines, for example, per cylinder. In the EU, it's much the same, but notice that here we've got the CO2 categories in grams of CO2 per kilometer traveled, and that's the, in 1995, it was that uh, distribution of new car registrations, and it's moved significantly left to low emissions in the succeeding uh, decade. But the sort of trend in uh, vehicles, uh, ever increasing power, uh, but decreasing CO2 emissions and increasing mass. So what sort of control problems do we have in engine management? Well, there's a large variety of sensors and actuators. Um, and <laughs> bearing in mind that uh, the manufacturers, if at all possible, will not put in a sensor or an actuator if they can avoid it. So, but nevertheless, the number of um, sensors and actuators is increasing all the time to meet those very stringent requirements. The control requirements in, on top of the legislation ones are the customer performance expectations. Wanting to have the vehicle to have predictable behavior in the face of, uh, should we say, entirely unpredictable driver commands. Um, management of the after-treatment uh, systems. Uh, noise, vibration, harshness levels and to make sure you don't wear the engine out before its advertised lifetime. After treatment for gasoline engines was essentially solved by the three-way catalyst, followed by, or together with, very accurate air-fuel ratio control of the uh, mixture going into the cylinder. And so the, <coughs> the exhaust from gasoline en modern gasoline engines is really um, very clean. In the diesel case, in order to meet the Euro 6 levels, the next set of uh, emissions levels, um, that will be hard to meet without producing or <coughs> almost having the, um, the vehicle have a chemical factory after the uh, combustion engine and uh, with all sorts of different types of things for oxidation catalysts and particulate filters and NOx traps. And the industry is extremely active in that area to try and uh, uh, reduce the, the investment required for after-treatment for diesel engines. And unfortunately, most of the after-treatment also has a negative effect on uh, fuel economy. So here's a particular one that um, we've looked at. I had a student, Stuart Swift, um, looking at the control of a diesel particulate filter, where... <coughs> This is in the exhaust path, and you've got this honeycomb, and the exhaust gas goes through this honeycomb and then through the wall of the honeycomb and out of the other side of the honeycomb, and you get deposits of parti uh, soot particulates on one side, and then before it fills up, you have to then burn off this, uh, turn it into carbon dioxide, um, and that's a potentially exothermic reaction and the constraints there are to do that regeneration of the after-treatment system so that it remains safe. So you don't um, <coughs> get uh, too large an exothermic reaction to damage the honeycomb. And we did some work um, on looking at that as a um, hybrid system. Typical diesel engine configuration with the... Um, air intake going through a compressor connected to a uh, turbine, um, some it cooling and throttling into the combustion engine, out through driving the turbine, through the after treatment. Also, exhaust gas recirculation going back through here at certain parts in order to reduce the NOx emissions. So even for that, uh, sort of basically two input, two output systems. They were looking at the VGT and the EGR, uh, EGR valves. <coughs> and the inlet manifold pressure and the uh, mass of uh, air flowing through here. 
enormous amounts of calibration are done in order to uh, get engines to operate over the full range. And the number of parameters in an engine management system that have to be calibrated by looking at um, typically engine test cell. So back in 1960s and 70s, there were hardly any parameters. And then on uh, gasoline engines, spark ignition engines, uh, the number of parameters has increased to of the order of 40,000 a decade ago. And that curve, I think, has carried on going, but I wasn't able to find out more recent data. And um, diesel engines um, are somewhat behind, but on a steep slope as well. So the calibration problem here is, um, <coughs> takes a, a, a long time um, and is uh, very entirely, essentially entirely empirical. So modeling internal combustion engines, there's um, m most of the calibration is regard to steady state operation, although lots of transient calibration in as well. Um, from a control perspective, mean value models are um, commonplace where we take an average over one engine cycle um, and either looking at the time as being a, the crank angle or um, absolute time. Partial differential equation models of increasing complexity, you know, one, two, or three-dimensional flows. Uh, flow plus chemistry. Um, we had a project on homogeneous charge compression ignition engines where, uh, from a control perspective, we were thinking of there being two species of gas, basically fuel and air, um, and a couple of reactions. Um, Whereas a follow-on project by our chemical engineering colleagues considered 157 species and 1,552 reactions. So uh, the complexity of a, a, a model suitable for control will be somewhere, I guess, between the two. But the, um, there's no limit to the complexity of the models. Um, but there is probably a fairly fundamental limit to the um, predictive capacity of the models. And so we have um, steady state tables from, so th those are, uh, if you like, um, phenomenological models, uh, and then lots of empirical models based on steady state data and uh, system identification as a function of the operating point. And there are some potential dangers in using global physical models in that the sort of way that um, if your controller is based purely on a global physical model and you uh, test it and find that in certain conditions it doesn't work very well and so you should update your global physical model then there's the question of does that affect um, how, how does that affect the operation of the controller in the rest of the operating regime where you thought you'd uh, tuned it to work satisfactorily So here's um, just to show that we have a, an engine test cell facility, a couple of test cells looking rather like this with, a, um, in this case, a diesel engine being uh, driving or being driven by a <coughs> um, motor. So this, just to, as an illustration, um, in a turbocharged diesel engine model, uh, illustrated by that picture, we might have a dozen parameters, each of which would be scheduled with regard to the engine operating point, for example, the speed and load of the engine. And that would then give you a linear parameter varying type of model, which could be used for control system design and uh, plugged into, this is just a, a, a Simulink block diagram with all the boxes having boxes within them. Um, in our situation, we're also <coughs> looking at 1D uh, dynamic simulations 
So this one here is a uh, one-dimensional <coughs> flow model for the air path uh, in the engine based on um, a Ricardo software product called Wave. Uh, so <coughs> we have the <coughs> engine controller here connected to the simulation or uh, with the, and the dynamometer here representing the load to the system in normal operation. And then all the details of implementing that <coughs> in a, on, a, on the real engine, which is entirely uh, non-trivial. Here's sort of <coughs> experimental results and simulation results of looking at the transfer function from two input to output subsystem there on the turbocharged diesel engine. And all I really want to point out here is that <coughs> the uns low free this is just for like a 5% variation in operating point. You find here that the model gives you 180 degree change in the DC gain, uh, the, sorry, the DC phase. So uh, you can get um, even the sign of the transfer function here uh, between those two channels can, um, uh, can change with relatively change, small changes in the operating point. To do more detailed modeling, um, my colleague Nick Collings, together with the student Alex Darlington, um, <coughs> was trying to model what was happening when you had significant pedal changes on the emissions. So a, a sudden change in the throttle position in those three places, followed by a significant increase in the uh, NOx emissions. And trying to figure out what the uh, cause of that was, uh, to the extent that uh, he produced uh, an in-cylinder gas sampler, was able to find out what the, uh, at a particular point in the combustion chamber, what the CO2 concentration was um, at uh, a very, this is uh, each uh, pressure peak here corresponds to a new compression of the gas in the cylinder and you can see that the CO2 concentration is tracked as it goes through that. And from that was able to get <coughs> detailed model, more detailed model empirical model of what was going on inside the cylinder and hence uh, significantly reduce those uh, NOx spikes that we saw on the previous slide. What we're currently looking at is on, uh, as um, uh, a lot of people are, is looking at uh, engine downsizing and the control challenges associated with engine downsizing. Um, it's been identified that uh, for better CO2 emissions, what you want to do is to get uh, a, a, well, a significant opportunity is to use a downsized engine. And the problem is in a normal nas naturally aspirated engine, um, in the engine speed, engine torque axes, um, your normal driving is down here in that range. But the high efficiency of the highest efficiency of the engine is more up here. If you decrease the size of the engine, uh, then you can have the normal driving and the highest efficiency in much the same area. Um, but then you haven't got the power, and at high engine speeds, you can recover that power by putting, doing a significant amount of turbocharging. <coughs> but that gives you, um, at the low engine speeds, gives you a, a power torque deficit in the downsized engine. And so the various people are looking at techniques to try and remove, fill in this gap here, so that for the customer perspective, um, your downsized turbocharged engine behaves much the same as a much larger naturally aspirated engine. Sort of thing trying to make a, a one 1.1 liter engine 
feel like it's a two-liter engine and have significant uh, fuel economy benefits. Here's a sort of challenge in control on that sort of thing. So just as one component, uh, the compressor. So in a, a couple of parameters on a, a compressor map, going for the a normalized uh, mass flow parameter and a pressure ratio parameter, where should you operate the compressor? Well, if the pressure gets too high, then you get a problem in perhaps um, getting too high a cylinder pressure. Uh, if the turbo speed gets too high, that's again damaging to the turbo side of the turbocharger. And quite importantly, um, the so-called compressor surge, if you, you need to be the, to the right of this line, um, the, uh, the various curves here, uh, this, these curves correspond to efficiency, um, and these curves here are increasing um, compressor speed or turbo speed. That's the, uh, much the same. So what we're trying to do is to stay to the, uh, accelerate, uh, increase the mass going into the uh, uh, engine as quickly as possible, uh, but staying on the right side of the surge line. And so one, this is now just simulation. Uh, in this case, using model predictive control for a, a model predictive control particularly well suited to hard constraints. And um, so in this case, we're looking at an essentially open loop trajectory uh, going from um, an idle to uh, maximum acceleration. Um, so for example, cruising in third gear and then putting the foot flat on the uh, throttle flat on the floor and trying to accelerate as quickly as possible to overtake something. Um, and the, the principal limit there is the surge line, the surge limit of the compressor. And with this particular control, MPC control law, we're able to match that until it was no longer the, the critical constraint. And so I think there's quite a lot of interest in this area at the moment on using MPC-like controllers to uh, go through transients of this sort, or at least determine what the limiting behavior is, uh, what are the real limits for transient behavior. Um, this is just, uh, uh, in the UK, we had under, uh, at least under the last government, uh, an office for low emissions vehicles in the UK. And um, what should be done in order to encourage, um, this is low emissions principally of uh, CO2, and to uh, encourage that, and what assumptions are required in order to, uh, to make that happen. Um, electricity production in the UK is presently principally from um, burning oil and coal, and um, so say 80%. So electric vehicles don't, at the moment, make a lot of um, CO2 cents uh, because of where the electricity comes from. But uh, if we assume in time that it will be switched to be uh, much lower carbon intensive, then uh, one can uh, then think in terms of um, plug-in hybrids, electric vehicles, and elsewhere. So just with regard to some uh, tentative conclusions on engine management, we've got, there are lots of uh, control problems um, in engine management and powertrain control now, and there'll be more in the future. Um, the modeling side is very non-trivial. Um, much of the modeling is done on the, uh, after construction of the engine, rather than in simulation of a tentative engine. And the sub-problems can be addressed um, with existing and developing control methodologies. 
Um, in some sense, the whole problem doesn't fit particularly easily into our standard control paradigms. Um, going over a huge operating range, lots of very special cases to consider, um, and uh, a fairly uh, intricate connection between um, uh, decision logic and um, continuous dynamics, and switching from one mode to another. Um, and so in the whole engine test area, a significant part is after it's been developed, put into a car, and it's driven around by experienced test drivers for thousands of miles. And finally, control has rather little to say at the moment, I think, about what sort of um, control architecture one should have um, o overall. So that, that was, um, I think, you know, a, an area where there's a huge amount of uh, international interest and uh, activity going on both inside universities uh, and very much in the major manufacturers. Let me now talk a bit about um, another completely separate project on um, vibration control in um, oil well drilling. Um, the scale of these operations are quite <coughs> stunning. So the, I think the current world record for how long a, a, a hole has been drilled, they tend to go down several thousand feet and then can go horizontally of the order of, uh, say, 10 kilometers. I think it's about a bit, a bit more than 10 kilometers is the, the record. Uh, horizontal extent of, of such a hole in the ground. And they can do, I don't know what the figures for accuracy are, but it's really very impressive. And uh, the way, uh, it's actually the, the force on the uh, drill bit at the end here is actually caused by the weight of the drill string here. Um, and so that the, uh, <coughs> at the rig at, on the surface, it's, um, it's not pushing, it's pulling um, to uh, control the amount of weight on, on the bit. And there are various sensors um, downhole, but at the moment, very limited communication between the um, uh, <coughs> uh, bottom hole assembly and the surface. The, the, um, it was put to me that this is wireless communication between here and here, but not as you know it, uh, because the, um, the way they uh, communicate is by putting pressure pulses in the mud that is circulated here to remove the chippings. And you can get to uh, bit rates of about 10 per second. So it's... Um, very low bandwidth at the moment, although now you can, um, they have de developed uh, wired pipe, which I think is really quite expensive, but would then get you into uh, <coughs> kilohertz of um, communication, and an interesting question is how, uh, what you would do with that. So the, an overview here um, you've got a steel pipe uh, in 10 meter threaded sections. Um, typical aspect ratio is ten, of diameter to length is something like 10 to the fifth. So although if you look at a piece of pipe like this, it looks um, <coughs> pretty much a um, rigid body. When it's of that aspect ratio, it looks like a, um, very far from being rigid and it can bend and twist. And as I just mentioned, you've got tension in the upper part of the pipe and compression in the lower part, giving the uh, weight on the bit at the end. It's got a vary going through uh, various types of rock and different types of fluid flow, um, sometimes going through quite uh, intricate uh, trajectories, and may have vibration problems of various types. <coughs> 
um, in torsional vibration, which is probably the easiest to analyze, um, there are various damage that can be done. Um, and you can, there you can get, the vibration there might be in a, a stick slip vibration where you get the pipe, uh, the, the drill bit or another part will stick and then the pipe will wind up until the torque is sufficient to get over the stick, then it would slip again, go around a few revolutions and then stick again and, and then carry on like that and give um, various damage, in, including possibly unthreading a, a, a drill pipe. And modeling to get um, again, the ideals of getting high, high, high realism and um, efficient, <coughs> and the realism worrying about fluid interactions and complex trajectories, regions of contact. Um, but efficient computation and clear insight into the physical processes, preferably having a fairly simple model and worrying about um, uncertainties. And so one tries to, a trade-off between very high, apparently high resolution finite element models and um, rather simple lump parameter models. Uh, on this particular chart, it said that these are certainly more complex. Whether they're more realistic is another question um, because the amount of uh, calibration required can be very high. So our postdoc working on this project, um, Tori Butlin, um, decided to do the following, which is to do the drill string itself is relatively linear until it hits the wall of the hole. And the number of uh, times when uh, uh, places where that happens is relatively uh, small. And so he was looking very much at essentially linear dynamics in here, but with strongly nonlinear functions at the uh, cutting point at the drill and, uh, and wall interactions. So looking at sort of essentially linear systems, but with some strong nonlinearities spatially distributed. So for the, I'll just uh, say a, a, some brief words on this with regard to the linear part. We can just use sort of standard transfer function things, but on a distributed parameter system. And it's a periodic structure on this distributed system because of the, the, the uh, drill string with the joint segments that go between them, which make a significant difference. And so one can go through looking at the... Um, input-output behavior of this um, with T as being various, the torques at the different places and theta dot as being the angular velocities at the different points along the drill string. So we could end up determining the uh, downhole angular velocity in terms of the downhole torque and the angular velocity at the surface. So with 100 sections, say, so just a uh, kilometer of drill string, transfer function from angular velocity to angular velocity has, uh, is apparently relatively constant, but this is in dB, and has some uh, notches in it because of the periodic structure. But if you look at just the low frequency part of this, it actually looks like that with, again, a, a 7 dB uh, oscillation here in the uh, transfer function. So <clears throat> really quite a complicated transfer function. The impulse response, then you see uh, 0.3 of a second to the uh, for, for the first um, the impulse to reach bottom of the hole and then 
reflections coming back up and down the drill string. And an exponential decay. So just a sort of a little control aside, really, um, but it sort of fits into the way we think of things. Um, looking at the um, representation of the downhole torsion response, um, for modeling efficiency, um, what was done was to just use um, final impulse response filters to model some of those linear dynamics. Um, but then at the, uh, for the nonlinearity, if we're looking at a um, Coulomb friction law um, and the feedback going from the angular velocity uh, through to the torque downhole back onto <coughs> um, the angular velocity, uh, then we have a feedback loop there. And for stability of that, well, it's all sort of... Um, reasonably passive systems down there. GN itself um, is positive real because of the inherent passive dynamics. Um, and so even if you've got uh, something as severe as a Coulomb friction nonlinearity, um, you'd still be stable for that uh, downhole part of the um, analysis. However, and the, well, the Nyquist diagram is uh, positive real, and so it doesn't encircle a minus one point for any gain. But then if you interpolate an FIR filter around a thousand points on the unit circle, um, and then draw the Nyquist diagram for that FIR filter for the points uh, between those uh, thousand points, then you get this artifact here, together with all the other artifacts. But this artifact makes it very clearly not positive real. And hence, if you did that simple um, approximation, FIR filter matching a thousand frequency points on the Nyquist diagram, plug it into that simulation, uh, this makes it this uh, simulation go unstable. To overcome that, uh, let's just go on. <coughs> if one looks at the real and imaginary parts of a transfer function, then you know that the real part of a transfer function is equal to the Hilbert transform of its imaginary part. And we know that the sampled transfer function is already positive real. So we could regenerate the imaginary part by inverting that expression. So instead of trying to match the real and imaginary parts for a finite set of frequencies, what we do is you match the real part, make the imaginary part the inverse Hilbert transform of the real part, and that uh, even, even when that, with a finite impulse response, in fact, that gives uh, very good results, matches the um, ramp response uh, very accurately. And for the Nyquist diagram, um, this has got the original um, and uh, the interpolated ones, and they're very close until you get to the sort of Nyquist frequency area. Um, when there'll be a significant deviation between the two, um, <coughs> but you preserve the positive realness. And then results such as the uh, step response with a Coulomb friction law uh, can give this type of behavior with a almost going into a stick slip oscillation. Here, going into a stick slip oscillation, this is with uh, uh, some noise, um, and then doing analysis of when you get stick-slick oscillations for different um, 
operating points. And also, uh, Butlin, in this case, got some rather nice analytic expressions for when that might happen. But I think the general conclusion that we found in this is that um, these are rather special problems rather than ones that you can say, oh, here's a control problem, where's a control system toolbox for MATLAB, and just sort of plug it in and uh, design a controller. Uh, for this particular case, with the sticks of oscillations, you can do various things on the surface um, in order uh, to um, reduce their um, likelihood, uh, essentially by impedance matching type of arguments. Now, we had the late start. Um, yes, well, which is it? OK, so that's all right, is it? Yep. Let me just say a few remarks about a project that um, my student uh, Xiao Chan Yuan has been working on, on stabilization of thermoacoustic oscillations. And this is based in part on work from a, a previous PhD student in our combustion research group in Cambridge, <coughs> Balachandran, who worked with Professor Anne Dowling and Professor Mastarakis and had this nice piece of apparatus um, where there's a combustion chamber um, which is visible at the top. And uh, the fuel and air coming vertically up through that um, pipework. In outline, it looks like this. Uh, so this is the so-called flame holder. And the flame burns in this region here. And the flame front here um, is a sort of circular flame front um, with two surfaces with the unburnt gas coming up here and the burnt gas going downstream from here. Relatively complicated modeling problem. Um, you've got to worry about the combustion dynamics, the shape of the flame front, and then the pressure waves uh, that go up and down this chamber and modeling the uh, upstream um, <coughs> uh, resonant chamber as well. Just for the uh, mo uh, sim simple model for the uh, flame front evolution depends on uh, an assumption that the uh, the flame moves into the unburned gas at a certain velocity, SU. And that velocity will depend, this is an empirical formula, based on the air-fuel ratio, or the fuel-air ratio, phi, at that point. <coughs> and it goes in a direction perpendicular to the flame front itself. This assumption the model assumes that the flame front itself is, um, is thin. And the type of experimental results that uh, Balachandran got, um, you know, this is, what, what he's doing is um, doing sinusoidal forcing of the system. And uh, this is during 166 hertz oscillation at different phase angles you see how the flame itself uh, changes. So this is just a 160th of a second here with the flame going through these large variations. Is it safe for me to go out of uh, PowerPoint and into a little animation and back? <laughs> it's... Um, <coughs> So here's a simulation based on those partial difference equation models of the, just in MATLAB, of the, the flame front. The, uh, 
the red is unburnt gas, and the white above here is all burnt gas. And you see how the, uh, and the flame front is the bit between the two. So you can see with this, this is very large amplitude uh, perturbations, um, sinusoidal perturbations, and you can see producing uh, very uh, complicated behavior, even on the basis of the idealized partial differential equation. So that's just sim simulating this together with another model, um, wave equation model for the acoustics. And then, <coughs> so coupling the flame and the acoustic models together gives you this uh, limit cycle. Um, this is looking at the fractional perturbations to the fluid velocity, the pressure, and the heat release. Um, we're still working on the control design, but the one, this is now at least a year old and somewhat better designs now available, but this is uh, stabilization by modulating the um, fuel flow and uh, indeed here's the limit cycle which is stabilized as a result of um, this control action. But we're trying to do some more rigorous analysis of that. This is just simulation. Um, and been looking at sort of the IQC analysis um, developed by Magretzky and Ranser and trying to approx get approximate bounds on the nonlinear deviations and linearizing uh, from the linearized models, um, approximating the PDE by, say, n discrete points. Um, and then sort of a sensible number for n is like 30 uh, and then you get an IQC with a delta block of size 12n by 6n um, and we found that the uh, performance in both uh, speed and robustness of the current LMI solvers which the IQC results reduced to are uh, which were challenged by this scale of problem. And uh, <clears throat> we've got uh, questions about, um, uh, are, is there, do we have an underlying structure that we could exploit to make it uh, less challenging, more efficient, um, and as n becomes large, for example, um, can we prove uh, convergence to a correct answer? So this again, um, relatively complicated problem. Um, we've uh, not gone into um, experimental work here, but inherited experimental work in modeling. And I think our aspirations at the moment were, are just in terms of uh, simulation, but um, quite a challenging um, exercise nevertheless. And <clears throat> I'd like to uh, close at that point, I think.